Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can we kindly take our seats so that we can kick off with day two? I apologize for the delay. We had a couple of technical hitches, but it's going to be another fun-filled, jam-packed, exciting day. So, bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Maintenant, j'aimerais que on prenne nos, nos sièges and um, on commence, je pense. Je suis désolé qu'on a commencé en retard, mais tu sais comment c'est. De temps en temps, il y a des problèmes techniques, mais ça va, ça va aller, ça va aller. So, kindly take your seats, and we'll be kicking off in the next couple of seconds. So, bonjour tout le monde. Comment ça va? Très bien, très bien. Turn around to your neighbor and look your neighbor in the eye and say, hey, wake up. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. That's good. All right. Now that we are awake, what we'd like to do is a lot of times, you see, when you have a three-day conference, there's so much information. Yeah, tellement d'informations that... People understand things in different ways. So what we'd like to do is that we have to know what stood out for you yesterday. So we'd like you to pick out your phones. And we have the, the app that we, we shared with you yesterday. Cynthia? Go to, to polev.com. That's it. And we'd like you to answer this question for us. What stood out in yesterday's sessions? Take a couple of minutes. Just pour répondre à ces questions. Um, Cynthia? C'est possible de remettre pour le mot de passe et tout, parce qu'il y a des personnes qui demandent mot de passe et tout. So that everybody knows. Some people are still asking what is the password and the rest. So just so that everybody knows, Cynthia is going to re-put the information on the screen. But for those of you who are already comfortable with the system, just, just do us a quick favor and tell us what stood out for you in yesterday's session. Les choses les plus importantes. Qu'est-ce qui t'a marqué hier? So, so that we are able to capture this information and in the output document you can give us a feedback. So for those of you who can't see clearly, um, you'll go to polev.com and then you'll Type in as the password Pan African CO720. That's it. Voilà. Polev.com. Mot de passe, c'est Pan African CO720. And then tu réponds aux questions. On est bien, Cynthia? So, ladies and gentlemen, are we okay? Let me give you probably two or three more minutes. Then after that, we will jump into today's proceedings. What stood out in yesterday's sessions? So, during the course of today, we've got two plenary sessions. We're going to have a breakout session. And that's, the breakout session is going to be after the tea break. Then at the same time, we, we've got Lulu, who is still capturing the heart and soul of the conference. J'ai vu plein de personnes lui demander, mais comment tu fais ça? Where's all this talent coming from? How are you coming up with these drawings? Amazing. Et tu sais ce qu'elle fait? It's, it's just the, the inspiration she gets from each of the different presentations, and she brings them alive. Graphiquement. So you'll see them all on the wall here. 
And I'm sure afterwards the entire team is going to take pictures and we'll put them up on the website. Boss, are we done? We're good? To the other, you can't load. Cynthia, can you go back again to the load page? Because because even boss can't get onto the, the, the application. Even you? Okay, let's 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 make sure that everybody can can get on board because we don't want to miss any feedback. Just by a show of hands, how many people are comfortable with the system and can respond? Hands up, please, just so that we see. A. Okay, by show of hands, how many people are not on and are having problems? You see, this is why people won't go to heaven. <laughs> so it goes to CC. If you have a problem, but you're here dying. In Africa, we call it dying locally. Huh? Do not die locally. If you have a So let's go back to the other page. Cynthia. Let's go back to the page and let's make sure that the application is working properly. So I think step by step, the first thing you need to do is please make All right, that's the first thing. Use your room code. Make sure that you are connected to the internet. That's the first thing. Then after that, you need to go to www.polev.com. And then you input the password. Kindly project that, Cynthia, so that everybody is on the same page. Okay, Cynthia, so is this what people are supposed to see? This is exactly what people are supposed to see. Uh -huh. And then on username, what do you put? Okay, so just so that everybody's on the same page, what you're supposed to see is you're supposed to see join a presentation. Join a presentation. You'll see polev.com and it'll ask for username. The username is where you enter Pan African Co 720. Then you will be able to access everything else. Are we okay? Are we good? Only beer? Boss, are we good? good? Ah, fantastic. This is one of the few times that we will allow you to cheat on your neighbor's results and, and, and ask for, for help. Uh huh. Um, the question that is here is taxation of intangibles, digitalized economy, finance, and technology. Cynthia, is that the question that you've upload? Huh? You've yeah. upload. So they're supposed to say what they want, what they, they take, what stood out from this session. Ah, they want what? What was your takeout for that session? So give me your takeout. What stood out for you in those sessions? Because there are two, there are two sessions, right? Yes. The morning and the afternoon, right? Yes. Brilliant. So I'll give everybody probably two or three minutes just to answer that, and then we'll dive right in. Très bien. Username, Pan African Co 720. Does it have to be in capital letters, Cynthia? No, no. C'est pas important si tu mets ça en majuscule or or small letters. All right, just a minute to go, and then we'll dive into today's presentations.
Okay, so um, I think let's let's close that. Should you feel like you haven't answered fully, you can you can come back to it in the next 30 minutes or during your tea break. But right now, what we like to do is that for those of you who probably missed a couple of things in yesterday's presentation, we've got a summary video which is going to showcase what happened yesterday. Bob, are we good? Drop the video for us, please. Thank you. So we need to link also the issues of the digital economy to the trade processes going on, to the CFTA. The CFTA, as Africa, can help us to come together to be able to chat our way forward as far as the digital um, economy is concerned. You know, we need, to, we need to agree as Africa what kind of pass, digital pass, are we going to take beyond taxing the digital economy, the digitalization, the technology, how do we use it to grow our economy, to grow our industries. Digital economy is making us look at taxes differently because taxes are not coming from the traditional sources anymore. I'm not always sure whether those who make tax policy understands this. And hopefully some of our discussions here will help crystallize that. Digital platforms and the supply of digital intangibles has produced a mixed bag of risks as well as opportunities for revenue enhancement and revenue mobilization, as well as the opportunity to take advantage of digital intelligence in order to police and encourage tax compliance. In equal measure, the growth of the sector has occasioned new decentralized forms of currency which are no longer linked or regulated by banks. So people are trading, people are doing business, people are transacting, transacting, and they no longer need the normal regulatory and infrastructure and institutional development that we have become accustomed to over centuries. And what does all of this mean for the mobilization of domestic revenue? In our opinion, the current nexus or and profit allocation rules dealing with this does not ensure appropriate taxing rights for source countries, and in particular for African countries. And this is partly due to the increasing digitalization of the global economy and the African economy which enables non-residents and in particular multinational enterprises to increasingly carry out businesses in African countries with no or very limited physical presence in that country. And so when you do book on Airbnb or on hotels.com or you do ride the Uber, there's a percentage of that income that cannot be touched, although that income has been generated in your domestic economy. The two central challenges facing the corporate taxation of the digitalized economy are nexus and profit allocation issues. And this has been said partially earlier. Nexus. So you have the likes of Facebook, Amazon, Google, supplying goods and services to our countries without necessarily having a physical present in our countries. We are not able to tax them. Why? Because the current nexus rules are deficient. Because it requires that before we can have the right to tax these companies, they must have a sort of a physical presence in our countries. So we need to link also the issues of the digital economy to the trade. I think that's it. Let's give a round of applause for what happened yesterday. Thank you. So I think um, we've We've eaten into a bit of time, but I, I must give full credit to the next panel. They're going to get there. Uh, Lela, don't worry. I'm going to give you your full one and a half to two hours. No, no worries whatsoever. The next individual I sat down with her, first of all, you must know that she's a no-nonsense lady, a future high court judge in the making. Yay. Now, please clap. Otherwise, you will all be in trouble. 
Yes. Um, she's a lawyer by profession, and for the last seven years, she's, she's got extensive experience in digitalization. She's looking into matters of fintech and the rest. She's worked here in Kenya. She currently lectures in the University of Cardiff, and she has a love for animals, particularly horse riding and pandas. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our, actually, our our moderator for the session today. L Laila, do you, do you really want me to, to finish with the introduction or you can finish all the introductions of all your panelists? In fact, I'll do that. Okay, so let's give a huge round of applause to Laila as she comes thank up, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Doolittle, for the introduction. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I am greatly privileged to actually host today's session on fintech. This session is incredible for two reasons. Firstly, our keynote speaker is a prominent and distinguished persona behind Kenya's digitalization phase. And secondly, we, we shall be witnessing an only women's panel on fintech. <laughs> this goes to actually debunk the rhetoric that fintech is a man's world. So we'll have a professor of tax law, a legal practitioner, and a researcher with a legal background discussing think technology with us. But without much further ado, today's keynote speaker is a man behind Kenya's digital space. He is a professor of entrepreneurship at the University of Nairobi. His research actually focuses on ICT and SMEs and how these two interplay in economic development in Kenya. He is an advisor to the Better Than Cash Alliance, a global initiative to digitalize payments. He is a chairperson of Kenya's Distributed Ledgers and Artificial Intelligence Task Force, a senior advisor to UN's Global Pulse Big Data Initiative. He has played his part in developing regulations in the growth of tech hubs in Kenya, and he was a permanent secretary at the Ministry of Information and Communication in Kenya. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome the good professor, Elijah Bitange Demo. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. I am very delighted to join you this morning, especially to talk about this topic of digital economies or fintech, which has become the driver of the digital economy. I'm going to focus on taxation of financial services uh, in this era of technological advancement. Uh, a lot of people are worried about the emerging cryptocurrencies and stuff like that. But I'm going to make one statement up front that if you look at what is happening here, uh, these are changes that have always happened since 1700. Um, first time mechanization began in 1700 to improve productivity. Then there was a second uh, revolution where we had mass production so that we can afford things. The third industrial revolution came, which leveraged on ICTs to create uh, productivity. A lot happened outside of Africa. But I think on the third industrial revolution, we played some small role um, by having mobile money, which has completely changed our lives. And we are now moving into the fourth industrial revolution, which is going to intensify the use of ICTs beyond where we have been. And I've said several times that if we miss, I'm saying, we in Africa miss this fourth industrial revolution, 
we would never be able to make it at all. I say this because I hear so many narratives around that these emerging technologies, especially the, the ones that will drive the fourth industrial revolution, which is blockchain, artificial intelligence, internet of things, robotics. Uh, the narrative that is going around is that these technologies <clears throat> are taking jobs from us. Um, they are not. And if we take those narratives and stay behind, we are the losers. I would explain it further as I move. And I came up with this, this curve. We normally use it to explain how technology diffuses in an economy. Um, you have the early stage, very early, early adopters. Then it moves on. If you see the last one, um, if you go to the last portion, that is called the laggards in the first. When the internet came <clears throat> in this country, very few people adopted this. And uh, we kept on using it. I think eventually we got almost everybody to use. I don't see many people leaking stamps anymore. Uh, they are sending mail uh, through many platforms that we have. And then came mobility. Mobility, we have used it. We see we have used mobile money and other things. Um, but that is coming to an end, and we are beginning to see another phase or another wave of technology, <coughs> which we call blockchain. And in this, we are at the early stages, and it is the early stages where people make mistakes all the time. Um, if you see the first wave, um, America played a huge role because they came up with the search engines, web browsers and stuff. And when it came to mobility, we found more other people came in, social media um, platforms, uh, mobile platforms. Um, the Chinese played a big role. They came up with some of their own. But in the blockchain phase, um, we are beginning to see those who are running ahead, but we still have a chance that we could do something. Uh, this is the broad introduction before I get into the details. And now we are want to see how can we, we need to understand um, illicit financial flows, and especially with these technologies. Um, the illegalities, we keep on talking about the money that flows out of Africa. Some of it goes like normal uh, money that is sent. Uh, if you open today's business daily, you don't even have to open it. The front page is um, that the Kenya government in 2016 uh, gave amnesty to the people who have money outside to bring it back. They brought the money back, 800 billion. But now they can't figure out where the money went. And and it just dissipated. They don't know whether it went back. They don't know um, where it is. Um, you can laugh, but the solution actually lies in technology. And also, we need to work very closely with the international. That's where the money is kept sometimes, you are going to see. And intensify the use of technology, especially what I said those technologies. I would explain as I move. Um, the other areas, um, as I say, these companies that you see here leverage on those technologies. They leverage on artificial intelligence to follow their money. They, they are not here to collect the money like we collect. The business models changed, and they continue to change. The ones you see here is just a token. You are going to see more other companies using these business models and completely taking money from here. We don't know how to recover that. You see Uber, they don't own any vehicle. Uh, they can walk out of here 
like they came. Um, the world's biggest media company creates no content. We are the ones creating that content. They make the money. So our biggest problem is failure to understand the emerging business models. That's our biggest problem, that if we understood uh, these emerging models, then we can play at the level playing field. So I will make a recommendation later on, uh, but this is one, one way that we need to understand. Unless you understand it, you miss the whole thing. So mobile money has gone international. Um, people send money from here to China to buy equipment and stuff and without going through a centralized place. You can see where the money is moving. Um, I think I'll move faster so that I explain one other thing. This is what is happening. Um, we receive about 30 billion um, into Africa in form of aid, uh, but we give out 192 billion. It's a very good business uh, that you invest this and then you make that much money. But if you look in detail, <clears throat> some of the money goes as profits from multinational companies, others, um, the bigger portions are the ones we consider to be actually normal. <clears throat> so what, why I showed this and I've moved quickly because you've spent so much time to discuss that is that how do we deal with the disruptive business models? How do we deal with it? So one is that <clears throat> we must understand data and data has changed over time. Uh, we used to look at it uh, from the past. Even in accounts, the auditors came when everything is gone. Give us the books, we look at it, then they tell you this is the match that has been stolen. Uh, things have changed. We are now beginning to move very close to diagnostics where we look at what happened and why so that we block that. But again, <clears throat> we can move further to where we can do predictive analytics. <clears throat> what will happen, um, when and why, so that you can block before everything has gone. Um, then once you understand that, you can simulate that so that you can pre pre prevent anything happening even without you being there. And at cognitive level, which is at artificial intelligence level, you can be able to understand that something is going on. I've been arguing with our Auditor General why he asks where the money went when he could actually have brought, covered that money before the money is gone. So big data is big in terms of understanding how everything works. Um, and I can come back to talk about it later. <clears throat> then blockchain actually is disrupting business processes and enabling new ones. I want to show you something that if you look at the traditional ways, um, the red means we have had gatekeepers in everywhere. You have uh, at the central bank, which is the centralized system, then you have the commercial bank, you get the beneficiary, you get the customer um, from the other side. Um, what blockchain attempts to do is to at an attempt to automate trust between different people. That, that's the simplest definition of this. Of course, we call it a, a, a distributed ledger, but its purpose is to automate trust. And now, what you see here, we want to move to where everything is digitized and the ledger is shared among everybody. But before you share that ledger, you have to have a consensus on how to use, uh, on what would happen. And this, this is where the lawyers come in. 
and the lawyers were the first ones to oppose um, blockchain. But since then, we have explained. The lawyers come and tell us the consensus on how everything is to happen. If we had cryptocurrency in this country, we would have a consensus that every crypto would have a ledger in central bank, the consensus. If it is not with central bank, then it should not operate in the country. Um, then the individual, myself, the customer, must give permission for you to access my data. And that's part of data protection. Then there must be a smart contract. And for the smart contract to be effective, I must actually sign that smart contract. And the reason why we are creating um, biometric identities, which can be used to sign those smart contracts, and then the whole thing is done. So this is actually pure legal. All we need is information from the lawyers. We automate it and put it in the system to protect my data, <clears throat> also to ensure that we go by the rules and the regulations. Of course, others have argued because it's, it's, it's a decentralized system, it may be difficult. But with this, if we knew everybody who brought money back into the country, the 800 billion that I talked to, it's very easy to trace where that money went. There is an element of traceability because every transaction is kept within multiple ledgers. Of course, like internet, there could be dark web where people hide, but still, if you want to use that money in the normal way, it would pop up from one of those dark webs, and then you can follow up. <clears throat> now, this one shows some of the um, objectives for this, um, but I want to point to areas where we could use, it, use this. Um, the proof of transfer, proof and transfer of assets, it's very easy to, to do that. Um, if we had it for assets, as we are creating a digital asset register, you can actually know where the money came from and who is transferring from who to who in a much more simple way. We have like six or seven identities. You can buy land with your identity card and buy motor vehicles with your passport and they are not linked and you don't know who that person is. So this is where we, we want to the application further. If you can look at the financial markets or the banking systems, KYC identity, that will be there. Payment of digital currency would also be the use case for, for blockchain. <coughs> I'll go faster. Then you have seen in this also telecom travel. Uh, it's other industries. Um, but let me quickly talk about the, the infrastructure that would facilitate this uh, so that we can be able to manage uh, this problem. <coughs> the entire Africa actually is covered now with fiber optics, even internally, what we call the terrestrial fiber, covers most of Africa. This would facilitate such transfers, but also would facilitate um, if government were to find out what exactly is happening, it's much easier to do with this. Then, like in Kenya now, we have developed this um, digital or the trusted identity, which is a biometric identity. We just finished collecting the data. Um, what it means is that you can trust me by the first meeting because you can, with my permission, remember I talked about permission, you can check multiple sources of information. You can check with the revenue authority if I pay taxes. You can check with the criminal records and see whether I've had any criminal 
you can check with immigration. Um, it would have multiple, all identities would be in one, and all databases would be in such a place where you can check <coughs> and validate. <coughs> okay. Um, one of the things that most governments have to do, and we've been talking about this throughout Africa, several conferences covering the whole continent, is education. Um, without education, we are not going to be able to manage the emerging business models. We must be in it. We can't be out and pray that someone would come to help us. We must have education from the lowest level to the highest level where we can be able to do research. We must begin to retrain people because the jobs we have will change. The new jobs that would come, we don't know even their names, but more jobs are going to come. We are going to see some of the people who feared mathematics, they will be doing data analytics because it's simpler, easier to do it now. Um, I would digress a little bit just to explain to you what AI has done even to this country. That AI has been able to show us that we can learn even in areas we feared to learn. You can do mathematics at your own pace. Um, the reason why you probably didn't do well in math is because the pace was wrong by the person who was teaching you. <coughs> this, 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 is, this, is, this, is, this is wrong. I mean, we have a school in Kenya called M. Shule, uses adaptive learning. And um, from this, you can be able to know that the kid is autistic or dyslexic or as ADHD, so that you can provide content at that speed. The government of Kenya is changing the curriculum to CBC where they can teach you at the pace you can understand. It has taken us many years to understand this. I've been teaching for the last 20 something years and I've always known in any class like this, there is 5% which can actually teach on my behalf there is 20%, you begin to see their faces when you lecture like, uh-huh, they understand. Another 20%, you need one full day because they ask you outside, did you mean? There is 15%, you pray to God that they understand, <laughs> what, but they will eventually understand if you deliver that content. Now, because of so many platforms for learning, you can be anything that you want to be. You can be the best coder, even though you didn't know anything about this. That's why we are talking about education, that you cannot say, I cannot learn now. You could. And we have created this. In Kenya, for example, we have a project called Digital Learning Program, which would start from the village up to university. And that has already started. Every country in Africa must have a digital learning program. It is, thank you. <laughs> it's a, a, digital, a digital learning program. Even learning the social media. We talk about data privacy. We are our worst enemies. We pump our personal information to Facebook and other things. So we need to learn this. And this continues the new courses that we must offer. So that through online, that's what I was talking about. Um, several platforms that we can do this. Um, I moved so fast to allow you to ask me any question. Yeah. Thank you so much. Asante Sana, Professor. So um, we'll open up the floor for questions directed to the professor because he has to leave in a few minutes. So, yes, the lady at the back. <coughs> uh, 
Good morning. Thank you for that um, really interesting presentation. I have some questions around blockchain. Um, I've, there's been a lot of discussion about the potential of blockchain because, as you said, it's supposed to be a way of automating trust. But um, a lot of uh, tech experts who I've spoken to have said the, the, the problem with blockchain is that if you put bad information in, you'll get bad information out because all it is is a ledger. So it's not necessarily true that it's going to correct for some of the issues, particularly on illicit financial flows, if the data that you're feeding into it is itself either incomplete or inaccurate or um, unhelpful. So I'm just curious about your thoughts no, about it that, being able to that, solve that. That's that actually problem. false. Um, <laughs> okay. what, if we created a, a blockchain for this country to trace illicit financial flows, it would mean that all the agencies that are following that, the banks, the civil society, and everybody. So if I put wrong information, someone somewhere would question that. What happens today is the secrecy of uh, that one person can do it. You remember I showed you the gatekeeper um, keeps everything. Uh, you don't know what's happening. The tax doesn't show you what they're looking for. But imagine everything is transparent out there, that every citizen would have access. Those whom you agree at the consensus level that we must put civil society, we must put government, we must put all this. We must, meaning that someone would actually see where there is a mistake and raise that issue. At the moment, you can take anything that you are told. Um, that is the difference between blockchain and the existing systems. So those who are saying that you can put garbage in and garbage out in something that is shared, do you know a cooperative? Cooperative, are you from Kenya? A cooperative society. Imagine we are members of the cooperative and you lie that you gave me 1,000 when I took 100,000. The rest would ask you, then what happened with the rest of the money? It's very easy to ask because it is a distributed ledger and you agree as to who has access to that ledger. Thank you, Professor. Alex. Okay, um, thank you very much, Professor. You have dis demystified blockchain. Hold on. Sorry. Where are you? Oh. <laughs> oh, um, okay. It was supposed to be Alex first. He I mentioned that. Watch out. But it's okay. Come. Okay, then Alex, it's okay? Right. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. I want to understand the issue of biometric uh, identity because I understand it's central to this. I know that many governments at home affairs, you also take um, biometric. Please just um, make me understand how that will then work across the country, whether ev at every point in time there should then be the identity with a number or... Thank you very much. Yeah, biometric w would help us in many, many ways. Um, besides using it, in a digital economy to validate who you are. Um, we can use it for many, many, uh, from mundane issues like uh, class attendance. The biggest problem we have today is a student attending class. If I put an AI camera here, I know who attended. But when I give them the, the form to sign, one signs for 10. So, and, so it's just that we have become very difficult. The same thing would be even at the airports, even walking outside here. Uh, we've had so many problems with terrorism in this country. Uh, it's very easy to, to know um, whom you can actually follow and ask questions. Uh, you see what has happened with the cameras we've put all over the place. Um, carjacking has not happened in Nairobi for the last three years because of these cameras, yeah? And they know that if you drove, they know where you can actually be stopped. But even identity 
biometric identity, India, which went ahead with the other system, it has really, really helped. Let me tell you one of the areas where people cheat most in the, our National Hospital Insurance Fund. People cheat. And those who are not insured, they actually use someone's uh, identity to go to hospital and the government pays for it. And if they happen to die, is when you see relatives coming saying, this is not the one who actually died. <laughs> but there is so much, <laughs> there is so much, there is so much that we can help with biometric identity. So much, I'm just giving you very little, yeah. Um, Alex? So my question really goes to the foundation of blockchain. I mean, the excitement about blockchain from its creators was sort of the lack of regulation of blockchain. And with the regulation goes with ownership of blockchain, who owns blockchain. There have been uh, arguments around a Japanese developer, not developer, Yakuzuma, whatever. Yeah. So if they're going to take blockchain to a more, um, to a more government driven facility of, you know, tax, as you said, biometrics and everything. I have a few questions. One, does that not go against the foundation of blockchain not to have a regulation of it in terms of the, the clearinghouse that you mentioned? But secondly, also, if there is no ownership, then how do you tie it to responsibility? Third, also, wouldn't there be corporate capture? If whoever that, is a, that, you know, that no one knows who owns the blockchain architecture decides to remove the plug, what happens to the life support that countries have, have become to rely upon? And so those kind of issues are the issues that if we're taking this these, um, infrastructure that has no ownership, how do we demand liabilities and responsibilities from something that is that absent? And I think that's something that we should yeah, think about. I, I think it's a very good question, but um, if you see, and I can send you our report, um, we can create our own blockchain for our own purpose. The central bank can create one which they are going to do for the banking sector and any other person who may require information from the financial sector. They can either allow you permanently or allow you with one transaction that you need to require. The issue of maybe Japanese or Americans owning that, that's our problem. We need to take the idea and create our own blockchains for our own purpose. Um, if we continue saying, okay, we import, you want to clarify the question? Or? So, so, so exactly, so, so my question again is, blockchain foundation has been absence of regulation. That has been the, 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 the seller. That's been what people said, right? So if you decide to create um, a regulation around something that was fundamental, uh, fundamentally described to have no regulation, wouldn't there be external negativities of that regulation that you're about to create? There is and how nothing, do you deal with there, it? There is nothing that would escape regulation forever. Even when AI came um, and the people said, oh, it's going to do this and the stuff, uh, we are begin, beginning to see the regulatory frameworks um, then came um, fake news, and the people thought this is the end. Uh, now we have apps which actually validate the information, whether it's fake or it's whatever. Um, even in blockchain, um, the word distributed, people think that it, 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 it is not regulated by anybody. But if you see what Facebook has done, with their Libra, um, they cannot come into this country um, with Libra without having to allow a central bank to see the flow of funds from here into that space. Um, and it's very easy. That's why I said we need to develop capacity to be able to know that that is followed. Um, that doesn't stop us uh, or criminals from creating dark webs like we have today. But we need to develop capacity to be able to respond to such challenges. And it, it would be bad for us 
if we brought regulatory framework ahead of innovation, we should allow innovation to take place and begin to look for solutions on how to regulate. Um, and that's, that's, that's the way I believe, yes. Yeah. Um, there's this talk about um, the sale of big data and trying to tax it. I was wondering, does Kenya have any policy on its position with big data, how it's supposed to capture it and secure it, perhaps? Uh, there are very many ways of capturing data. The, there is that which is um, the structured one, which we know most. There is unstructured data. Um, and when I was saying something about Facebook and us, we spew out our own data, and that's how you have uh, mobile lending companies to know about us. Um, but what the blockchain would eventually do, if you need my data, my data, especially structured one, which is kept in some places, um, you would have to go through the consensus of that to get it. But there is some data which you will never block, um, like the ones that is harvested from satellites and stuff uh, like that. So I don't know whether I've answered your question, but uh, the development of the data protection law also, um, and I've always said, we actually need to leverage on GDPR um, instead of trying to create our own um, data protection law. But it is for the good of humanity that some of the data is shared. For example, the health data, uh, so that we can begin to find solutions to problems that we have. Thank yes. you. Thank yeah. you. Is there any question? Yes, the madam from Uganda. I forgot your name. Hold on, um, we have to have some parity here. Uh, the lady here. Just now. Are there any questions on that side as well? <coughs> okay. And then you. And then you. Okay. Thanks. Um, just requesting for clarification about allowing innovation, then you regulate afterwards. I didn't get to that. Maybe if you can clarify on that, thank you. If I allowed you to, to regulate future things, what would you regulate? Mm. You have no idea what's going to come. Mm. So you just leave it. Um, we have done that in this country, M-Pesa. We didn't have any regulation at all. Um, some people said this is going to take money out of this country. But we said, let's wade it through and see what we can regulate. Now, mobile money is fully regulated they, because they understand it. What we have done in this country, we have created multiple legal sandboxes where you play with some technology, you know? And once you are fully satisfied that uh, it is not hurting the consumer, then you have at least something to regulate. Yeah? Uh, countries like Brazil have something called mission-oriented policy to allow people to make mistakes and be able to regulate from understanding the solution. So you cannot bring regulations ahead of creativity and innovation. Thank you, Professor. So, final last two questions from yourself and the gentleman there. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, from a tax collection point of view, uh, my name is Stephen Kaproma from Malawi. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. I can see. Uh, from a tax collection point of view, we that are in the tax administration strive on the idea of confidentiality of the tax affairs and that we don't want to reveal how much you are paying and what someone else is paying because we are violating the, the confidentiality of the taxpayer. Does this blockchain with this kind of uh, trusted sources make it disrupt that notion of... No, uh, if, uh, if uh, it, you, you are not going to put everybody's data out there, um, but there are people you would share the data with. Um, uh, and if, if you needed, if, for example, in Kenya, if I, I'm running for office, I have to show that I've paid my taxes. 
Now, what would happen is that it's not you to write the letter that I've paid my taxes. It must be seen in the ledger that I paid my taxes. We tried that last elections, and the politicians bought the letters from, from the tax. Anybody from Kerry? <laughs> <laughs> they got some, le somehow got letters from Kerry. Some got letters from universities that they went to college. And only afterwards is when they couldn't say who, they were, who, who their classmate was at the university. <laughs> so you can obtain single data for someone after I permission you. If I'm running for office, I would say, all right, you can check on my data. It doesn't mean that you are going to share that, the whole, but it is shareable system to system, uh, which removes the aspect of, of uh, tampering. And if you tampered with it, it would still have a stamp from the previous that I had not paid. Someone came in and changed that. So it's not, it's not a problem. But tax authorities, you have to understand data analytics. In this country, we have said that we do lifestyle audit, yeah? Lifestyle audit can tell about someone's income than what the pay slips and other things that you look at. And that's, I think we are beginning to see that happen uh, so that you can collect the taxes that, that are due to the country. Thank you. Um, your last question, please keep it brief. Yes, a lady. Yeah. Oh, yes, no, then we can have the lady Hello. after. For Hello. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Mine and there actually two questions yes. only. One, based on your facts or information that you have presented about Uber, Facebook, and the like, are there statistics that you can maybe share with us that can show that the financial flows in the, chain, in the blockchain that they can be applied perfectly between maybe uh, you can show maybe maybe Africa or Europe that we can buy and say based on maybe the statistics from maybe Europe they have shown that blockchain will will be applied perfectly. Two, we Africans, you are an African, we believe in privacy. Do you believe in financial flows, phenomena, that it will work, whereby each and everyone, even the tomato seller, you have to know the, his or her input to be displayed. Do you believe it is worth it, is it, worth it, worth it to be applied? I, number, let me answer the first question very easily. The data that Uber gets, the driver has it. Yeah, the, dr the driver, the Uber driver has that data and you can tell from what they are paid, how much was paid, how much has gone out, you can be able to do that. We need to analyze that data and get to the number of the amount of money that leaves the country that is not taxed. It's very easy for you to understand that. Um, and it's very easy for the telco to actually tell from that. So we need to begin to do data. That's why I showed that data analytics. And when we go to negotiate, we negotiate from a point of knowledge. It's not to go there and say, you people are stealing our money and whatever, and you have no facts on the table. And you, you could put that in place and you begin to negotiate what percentage should remain here. Nobody has done the data analytics, nobody is talking from the point of knowledge, and that's where we are wrong. The second one, I am one of the advisors of the UN Better Than Cash Alliance. Our goal is to ensure that everything goes through a digital platform so that we can collect that data and improve the lives of people. Even a tomato seller 
so that even the tomato seller could pay tax like everybody else. Yeah, I know that's what you are fearing. <laughs> but, um, and once we collect that data, we actually know, yeah? If you asked Kenya and Nigeria, the ones that five years they decide that their GDP is more than what it has been because you have a huge uh, informal sector, yeah? We don't know what our per capita income is. That is bad. So we actually need to know the total um, transactions for the, to see whether the economy is growing and other things. And that's why we need data from everybody, from the informal sector and formal sector, and have the total economy. So we begin to see what direction, what policies do we put in place from the government side. And also from the person selling those tomatoes, um, we can do mi micro data analytics and tell them you are not making money here. A lot of small micro enterprises, they actually don't make money because one person selling tomato, 10 people selling tomatoes tomorrow, they lower the price, nobody makes money, they keep on dying, that's why we are poor. We don't have data to help us make decisions or create better policies to help people from poverty. So you can't say that is privacy from getting that data to get anal analyzed. So I don't know whether I answered you, but your eyes look like I have been satisfied. Yes. La there's just one last question I'll allow. The lady at the yes, back. The lady, yeah. Yes, please. Now the lady. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Gladys Kitoni from the Kenya Revenue Authority. And uh, I happen to represent um, the authority in, uh, in uh, OECD's uh, Community of Interest on Digital Transformation. And we recently had an engagement on this topic. Um, and from that engagement, uh, what came out uh, from uh, a number of revenue authorities, actually from developed countries, is um, that um, they've not adopted blockchain yet because uh, they found it to be very expensive. And they've been able to realize the benefits of, of blockchain by using other technologies. And so for them, um, they've decided to adopt other uh, technologies um, as, um, as, as uh, they wait for, um, um, or, or they, as um, they wait for um, blockchain to, the cost for blockchain to uh, reduce. So uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yep, we don't have legacy issues. <clears throat> they have major data, databases for many, many years. They have some softwares. It's very easy for them to share uh, out of the cloud. Um, so for us, actually it's an opportunity for us to move forward and begin to use it. Um, you can't say it's expensive we can have our developers develop the blockchain and use it. It's just that initially everybody is asking very high costs, but we don't have legacy issues like the Western world has because they've invested heavily in other systems. The, what they're fearing is the cost of trans, transferring from that system to the new system. But for us, most of Africa, we have nothing like that. We should just jump into this and be able to, to take the leadership. Thank you, yeah. Professor. Thank you so much. Please, a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, um, I will now ask the panelists to join us at the podium. And I'll start by inviting Professor Tatiana Dos Santos all the way from Sao Paulo in Brazil. She is a tax law professor, a woman tax law professor. <laughs> there are not very many of them. Um, she is also the founder of Women in Tax, but the Brazilian chapter. She has carried out extensive research on the taxation of cloud computing, on 
VAT monitoring on digital goods. She has also looked at the Brazilian tax structure on digitalization, compared it with the proposed OECD model, and argued that they are fundamentally different. So a very nice Global South rhetoric on how we should be leading discussions on digitalization of tax, the Brazil way. Now, her research project is currently focused around the taxation and regulations of cryptocurrencies of which she will be discussing. I will then invite Mrs. Naro Omo Osaji. Is she in? Because I've been looking for her. Oh, there you are. All the way from Nigeria. She is a legal practitioner who represents multinational technology companies and local startups. She is specialized in the field of e-commerce, blockchain, intellectual property, digital law, and policy. What an honor to have you. Thank you. And finally, I will call upon TJ and his very own Riva Jalipa. <laughs> You'll have to guess whether she's Chinese or Singapore or Philippines. I can't place her. <laughs> but she's, she's actually born and brought up in Kenya. Um, Riva studied law at Leicester and then continued to pursue her master's degrees at SOAS. Currently, currently she is with TJNA, overseeing the Fair and Equitable Tax Program. She leads on the Fair Tax Monitor, a simple uh, assessment tool to determine how different countries are um, ensuring that their tax system is based on the principle of fairness. Um, Prior to joining TJNA, Riva was advocating for human rights. Right, Riva? Yeah. Yes. And she was also working for Article 19 on digital rights. And she also had the pleasure to develop Kenya's ICT policy by working with ICT Action Network. She will be discussing the concept of data protection and data localization, looking at blockchain as well. So a very amazing, beautiful panel of women in thin technology. A round of applause. And <laughs> thank you. And I will start by asking um, ladies, as, as you come to give your talk, if you could comment, maybe a, a comment or a discussion on what the professor had said, and then you could continue with your discussions. Thank you. Tatiana. Listen to me? Yeah. No. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. First of all, I'd like to thank for the kind presentation and also for uh, the invitation to be here. It's a real pleasure for me to share with you some thoughts on Brazilian uh, tax legislation on that. Uh, before starting my presentation, I would like to make some remarks on this great lecture that we uh, have just heard. And um, what I have to say to you is that um, I think our challenges are very similar because we, we have to develop a way to audit these transactions in blockchain environment. Um, from my point of view, of course, we can use blockchain uh, to allow uh, tax, um, tax policies and also to, to allow uh, tax administrations to audit transactions, but also we have to think about it uh, in a sense uh, in which uh, people who are doing uh, trades and exchanges and transactions in blockchain environment do pay their tax correctly. So I, um, it's, it's the, the presentation was really interesting, but uh, my focus will be in other perspective. I would like to present to you um, how in Brazil we are dealing with this reality, not from the perspective of the administration, but from the perspective of the taxpayers. So uh, what do we have in Brazil in terms, both in terms of uh, regulatory rules and also taxation rules on that. So I will divide my, my uh, intervention here in these two parts. First, I will address the um, uh, regulatory framework or wish issues that we have in Brazil, and then I will shift to the taxation issues. 
Going to the regulatory issues, uh, I must say to you that Brazil has decided not to regulate cryptocurrencies or transactions with it. This decision was made two years ago when the Brazilian Central Bank um, issued a notice stating that this kind of transaction would not be regulated by it. And shortly after that, in 2018, uh, our um, um, Securities and Exchanges Commission said that they will not regulate either. So we don't have a regulatory framework on that, but despite of that, transactions with cryptocurrencies uh, are permitted, uh, they are allowed in Brazilian environment. And in short, uh, what we do have is a, is a, is a, stent, a statement saying that cryptocurrencies should not be treated as um, foreign currency or electronic money or securities. So there is no um, juridical qualification on that from the regulatory point of view, of view. But exactly because the transactions are permitted, our tax authorities saw on it a possibility to tax because these transactions are happening in Brazil. People are dealing with cryptocurrencies. And so, since 2016, the individual who owns uh, cryptocurrencies has the duty to report its ownership in his or hers income tax return. So if I have bitcoins, for example, I have to report it in my income tax return. And of course, um, I don't have to pay any tax on that, or any income tax on that, but just to report um, in order to the tax authority know that I own that asset. And uh, in case of alienation with profit, uh, in this case, uh, I will have to pay income tax on capital gain. And our rates varies, vary from 15% um, to 22.5%. And uh, therefore, there is a, a first topic here that I want to address to our debate. Um, that is a big paradox that we have in Brazilian legislation because we do have tax rules, so uh, we, I have to pay income tax uh, on cryptocurrencies if I have a profit in alienation it, but I don't have any regulatory framework. I think this is, can be a problem because there is no uh, protection from the state in case of um, alienation or exchange of cryptocurrencies. This is one point that I, I think we should uh, think about it. Uh, secondly, uh, from my point of view, Brazilian legislation does not answer how to tax at least two very common situations that take place in a cryptocurrency environment. I'd like to address both here. The first one is regarded exchanges between virtual currencies. So uh, let's say that I have three bitcoins, and I have reported that in my income tax return. And in Brazil, for example, you can use these bitcoins to buy a car, to buy real estate, to buy wines, and even magazines. But I decide to use my bitcoins to have other type of cryptocurrency. For example, uh, as you may know, we have more than a thousand of, crypto, of cryptocurrencies in the market. So I decide to exchange my Bitcoins for Litcoins. And in this case, it's very, um, it, it's fair to say uh, or to assume that I had profit in this kind of transaction. Because uh, let's say that my Bitcoin, I, I bought my Bitcoins like five years ago, and uh, uh, during this time I have um, his values, it, 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 its value uh, has changed, and now I have profit from that kind of exchange. In this case, should I pay income tax on capital gain? This is a 
question that uh, Brazilian legislation uh, does not answer. Because uh, from the Brazilian point of view, um, we only will have profit uh, in case uh, of um, my gain is related to a physical good. So I will only have profit if I transform uh, that asset that I have in a physical good. And in this case, the transaction is totally virtual. So if it's totally virtual, because I am exchanging a virtual currency for another virtual currency, do I have to pay income tax on capital gain on that? Um, we don't have an answer for that. And of course, there is ability to pay, because I had the profit. Uh, but I don't think we have grounds to tax it. This is uh, the second question, uh, the second point that I would like to address here for our uh, debate. Uh, and the third point um, that is related also with the hoopla's that Brazilian legislation has uh, is related to the mining activity. As you may know, and as you could see from this great lecture that we uh, have um, here before, uh, blockchain is a technology in which transactions with cryptocurrencies take place. Uh, in very simple terms, and I don't like to, um, to say more uh, from blockchain because it was uh, said before, but in very simple terms, it is a software which has several computers connected to it in a network. And it's a collaborative network. All the computers work together in order to make that network functional. And in order to, um, in order to have transactions with cryptocurrencies. These computers are called nodes. And they validate the transactions with cryptocurrencies. And this validation is made by the solution of a mathematical equation. The first node who solves the equation is the one who validates the transaction. And after that, all the nodes have to agree with that validation. That's why uh, we have a consensus uh, in this kind of network. So let's say that I want to send uh, one Bitcoin to Lila. And uh, I will do that through an exchange. For example, I, I can uh, operate uh, directly in the blockchain, or I can do this uh, by uh, using an exchange, which is an online environment. So I ask the, ex the exchange to uh, send the or order to the blockchain in order to do this transaction. And then um, the order that uh, is sent to the blockchain is an order in form of a mathematical equation. And uh, this order is sent to the whole network, and the computers connected to this network um, starts to start to work on the solution of this mathematical equation. And the first one who solves it uh, validated the transaction and said, OK, this is Tatiani. Tatiani is a person. Uh, her ID is correct. This is, she has this amount of bitcoins. And this is Lila. Uh, she's a person. She's, uh, the, the, his, her data is correct. And then I will send uh, the, the, the bitcoin to her. And by doing that, this node, by validating the, the transaction, this node um, receive, uh, receives a reward. What kind of reward? The system, the blockchain, generates new bitcoins uh, that are transferred to this computer, to the node. And from that oper operation, the, from that transaction, we can say that bitcoins were mined. So that's the, 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 the figure of miner. We have the miner here, which are the node, the computer that validates the transaction and then get, gets bitcoins uh, because of that. The question is, 
since we are in a uh, decentralized environment, is it possible to say that these bitcoins are income earned? Because from my point of view, there is no service being provided. The nodes are not providing a service, a proper service, because we are talking about a network which is decentralized and uh, there is no third person involved. And the bitcoins are just generated by the system. There's, there's no person who pays it. So um, in, from the, the perspective of Brazilian legislation, we don't have grounds to tax it either. So there is no income tax due uh, because uh, there is no prov there is, there's no provision of a service, there is no income earned. So, um, this, uh, this is a, a, a challenge that I would like to share with you, uh, because uh, in Brazil we are trying to tax these transactions because our market is not irrelevant. We have uh, money involved in that, and uh, I feel that our tax authorities are missing uh, very important points by just saying that we have to pay income tax on capital gains, um, considering profit, profit with bitcoins or cryptocurrencies transactions. I think that is not enough. I think we should um, stimulate debates on this topic in order to build a, 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 a a secure, um, a secure environment to these transactions and uh, legal certainty is uh, necessary, is needed in order to have um, technological advancements. And I cannot see this in Brazil now because we have, as I said, uh, a big paradox, no regulation but taxation. And even with taxation, we don't have legal certainty in uh, several matters. And I don't know if I have time, but I, I will just uh, finish my, my talk here uh, saying that for me the big challenge is the, um, the, the auditing of this kind of uh, activity because um, our international rules were built considering a central authority, considering the uh, financial institution. And we don't have a financial institution or, institution or a central authority in a cryptocurrencies environment. So the big question is how the tax authorities are going to audit it uh, this kind of trans uh, transaction and to assure the correct payment of taxes that certainly are due. So I thank you uh, so much for uh, the invitation again, and I am willing to uh, hear uh, from you what do you have here and how can we cope these challenges together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Naro? Oh, no, you have the mic right ahead. Uh, thank you. That was a wonderful uh, presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, so quickly, just uh, responding to what the key speaker said in his very incredibly illuminating presentation, I'd just like to say there's something that I took out from that, and it's that um, government authorities are more aware of how blockchain technology is demanding transparency for them. And I really liked that his mind was on that. I liked that he was sharing the government perspective and saying, look, we can't hide these things. Blockchain makes sure that we share these things out with everybody. So I like, um, I like, that. I like that we are seeing that transparency angle. And also, thank you very much, um, Tax Justice Network, for inviting me. I'm having a very, very wonderful time. I've learned so much already. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, so I like the questions that you raised, and I like that you uh, took the very technical perspective, because I'm going to be talking about policy, and I think that this is, it's really good that you went before me, so I could uh, just start from there. Um, you asked um, if there is no framework for cryptocurrency taxation, how fair is it 
that, sorry, if there's no framework for cryptocurrency regulation, how fair is it that we're demanding taxation? How, you know, how, how, how does that work, that paradox? And that's what I want to talk about. So my presentation is on what tax, is on shaping the policy landscape for cryptocurrency taxation and the role that tax authorities have to play in shaping that perspective. So cryptocurrency in particular is one aspect of fintech that uh, policy engagement has been lower than we would like it to be. And, and that's fair. You know, most governments across the world have adopted this wait and see approach to cryptocurrency. Everybody's just really looking and they want to know what's happening because central banks are aware of the risk involved in this space. And that apprehension has really colored the policy language. Between 2018 and 2019, we had central banks uh, warning their citizens not to trade in Bitcoin, not to transact in Bitcoin, because it wasn't protected. And if you lose any money, it's not legal tender. And you know, we, we, we saw this from um, the central banks of Nigeria, Kenya, and Tanzania. In fact, Namibia outrightly declared that it's, it's illegal to trade in uh, cryptocurrency in this country. And um, you, okay, I think I should mention that the Ugandan government, I should say that the Ugandan government has had a very warm attitude towards cryptocurrency regulation, which I, which I, think, is very, uh, which I think is very commendable. So regulating any kind of cryptocurrency is tricky business. Any kind of fintech is tricky business. But then cryptocurrency is even trickier because of the nature of cryptocurrency. So with uh, money lending systems, mobile payment systems, personal finance, we were dealing with things that we already knew. We all have money lending laws in our various countries. We have... Uh, savings and investment laws. And so it was possible to translate what we already had in the physical world, just, just take it to the digital world and apply those same rules there. And even with mobile money, even with money payment systems, uh, we, it, it's really payments. We already knew about payments. We know how to regulate payments. And so we were just translating our laws to the digital space. But with cryptocurrency, it's, uh, it's, a, it's kind of a whole new ball game. Uh, that you, you're dealing with a currency without the centralized nature of money that we are used to. And that kind of immersion can be very jarring. So I understand why the policy environment is as hostile as it is. And it's not just in Africa. I think that it's across the world. But as people who are talking about policies, people who work in policy, I think that it's important that we start to find ways to move beyond that, that we, how do we get from here? How do we move for us? Okay, so we know that it's tricky. And um, so in this space where we can't even talk about cryptocurrency without using language that frightens people, without using language that puts everyone off, you would imagine that a conversation about tax will be hard. But no, all everybody wants to talk about is tax. As of the first quarter of 2019, uh, uh, Nigerians were trading about $4 million a week in cryptocurrency. And all everybody wanted to know was, are they being taxed? Y you, nobody's talking, you know, how safe are these transactions? Are these people regulated? What happens if people lose money? Are you paying tax? So I think that, uh, I, I want to talk about tax. I, I think that it's good that we're talking about tax. But I also think that it's unfair to talk about tax without talking about shaping the policy landscape. It's unfair to have those conversations separate. Because in the first place, if tax authorities don't um, play their part in that policy landscape, in understanding that policy landscape, they may not know the various levels of cryptocurrency transactions and operators. They may not know who to tax or what kind of tax to demand. And uh, there's nothing wrong with wanting to tax cryptocurrency. I think, I, I think it's a good thing. But I think that any government that wants to tax cryptocurrency must be ready to do the work that it takes. They must be ready to study the technologies. They must be ready to study the market. They must understand the risk and the challenges. They must be, uh, they must be willing to learn how best to harness these opportunities that come with this innovation before we can talk about tax. We, we, we can't treat cryptocurrency like something that we're afraid of, like some disease that people should be aware of. And then in the same breath, we tell people that we want to tax them. 
And these are people who are engaging in transactions, engaging in businesses, knowing fully well, like you said, that they don't have the backing of government. If they lose money, there isn't any kind of, you know, there, there isn't any kind of regulation or anything to fall back. So I think that these people are taking risk. And I think that it's a bit unfair to start the conversation from saying, we'd like to tax these people without playing your part in shaping that policy landscape. Um, so any conversation about tax in this space has to also play its part in building that environment where policy language is not hostile by default. Only then can we talk about tax. And how do we, how do we uh, build that environment? It's conversation, really. It's these conversations. It's dialogue. It's ensuring that all stakeholders are at the table when you're making those rules, ensuring that there are avenues to have these conversations, ensuring that you know, stakeholders are involved at every point. There's something, as, as a lawyer who works in policy across different technologies, there's something that um, breaks my heart every time. I just sit down and I put on the television and I see that the government has made a new policy about something. And I'm like, how many engagements did we have? How many people's perspectives are here? You want this law to come into effect tomorrow, but you're not even considering the perspectives of the people who are going to be directly affected by these laws. I don't, I, I don't like that, and I don't think that that helps um, any of us. So um, the. Good news, I think I would say it's good news. The good news is that tax authorities are typically independent of central banks, so they don't need to wait for central banks to declare currency, declare legal tender, or say that this is legal. So they, they have, their, they have their, own, their, their own space that they occupy in shaping that policy environment. So, um, so they have responsibilities. So tax regulators here and representatives of tax regulators um, I think that it's important that you're very conscious of your responsibility in shaping that policy environment. So what, what, do, what do they need to know about shaping, about tax, uh, um, taxing cryptocurrency? The first thing we need to understand is the different ways that profits can be derived from cryptocurrency. Um, like she said, mining income. Mining income is the root of it, and deciding how to tax mining income. I have a thought on the question that you ha asked about whether it should be taxed as income tax or capital gains. Um, I think I've had a conversation with somebody about this recently, and I th what we took out of the conversation was maybe the day trading rules should apply. Like if you buy cryptocurrency today and you sell it today, then you pay income tax. But if you buy it today and you hold on to it for a longer time, then you pay capital gains tax. So I, I, I don't know if you, if you think what you think about that. Uh, so I don't know because that's what's in Switzerland. Uh, mining income is declared is, is declared as self-employment income, and then it's taxed as income tax. That's how that works. So for holding cryptocurrency, like people who just hold cryptocurrency, uh, there is some some other dimensions, which is the property dimension. Uh, cryptocurrency as intangible property, they tax it as an asset. So in the first instance, um, in the US, for example, people who hold cryptocurrency assets like Bitcoin, they tax, they tax those assets like stock, meaning that if you hold it for less than a year, you pay the short-term capital gains taxes, and if you hold it for longer than a year, long-term capital gains taxes. This is because uh, trading with cryptocurrency is like, it's seen as a barter arrangement of some sort because you're using an asset to get something, not that it's currency, not that you're buying something with money. So that's where that asset perspective, that's where the asset perspective comes in. And um, so there's another route which some of us may not like, but which I think that you would like, which is not taxing cryptocurrency at all, which uh, is this, which is what's happening in Malaysia and Belarus until. 2023, I think there's a law that comes into effect. And Brazil, which I, I didn't know, which is very interesting that I've just learned. So any of these approaches could work, but what matters is that uh, policy makers must be willing to do the work. You know, it's not, it's not like, oh, this looks scary, we're not going to regulate it, we're just going to step back and tell people not to touch it. You know, so it's about the willingness to do that work. It's very hard work. It's scary, I, I, can't, I can't say that it's easy. Even when Bitcoin entered into the um, 
stock market, the numbers were crazy. Everybody was terrified in the first few days. And I can't imagine how regulators will feel about that. But, uh, well, it's the job that needs to be done, understanding that landscape. Uh, so. Any of these approaches could work. It's up to policymakers who know the peculiarities of the individual tax regimes in their countries to decide what route to follow. But it's imperative that we decide fast. That decision to not take regulatory action is a decision in itself. And every decision has consequences. So I hope that we start to make good decisions. Uh, thank you very much thank for you. listening. And thank you for having me here once again. Thank you. Thank you. For, um, um, to respond to um, Professor's presentation, I think the thing that struck stuck um, struck at me f the most was um, if if you saw he had written immutability of information mm -hmm. slash single source of truth, um, and and the danger of uh, of one picture being made about you, um, and the, that that could be that could be hacked, that could be misused, um, and be, there being no alternative for you to engage in society because of. Um, how government is, is is preventing you from doing that because because you have to you have to um, submit this personal information. So um, at the extreme end, we've seen like in China, China doesn't have Facebook, they don't have WhatsApp, they don't have Google, uh, or they have a, they have a Chinese version of Google, um, and um, they they have WeChat, which is a combination of all of them, um, and they can use this data. Um, to sanction you. So if they don't, they, they call it a social credit. So depending on uh, how you're living your life, if they don't like it, they can prohibit travel and they can prohibit um, access to financial services. Um, so it brings us to the question of data protection, which is what my presentation is going to be about. Um, but before I begin, I just wanted to know how, my, how many of you would trust companies, tech companies more than your government about your data? Or do you prefer your government? Hands up for government. Do we have more faith that government will use our data better than tech companies? So this is government, okay. Okay, so the rest of you, you, you prefer tech, neutral, tech neutral. companies. <laughs> Sorry? No, none. None, no one, no one. <laughs> okay, so when, when, when these discussions about the tax and the digital economy first started, the first thing I thought of was exactly how can we have a disruptive and rebellious response to this? Because that's, it, is, it is a disruptive technology, how do, we, how do we respond likewise? And the first thing I thought of is keep our data. That's what China does, that's what Russia does. Okay, maybe not the best examples, but that's what they do. Um, and you know, you, you, bring, you bring tech companies like Google to the floor. Please, can we access your market? We're willing to censor whatever thing you want us to censor as long as we can access your market. What if we did that? And we're not saying, we're not saying that we need to do it uh, to the extreme, uh, as China is in terms of localization. Uh, purely, but what if we had barriers to that? So only some data. What if we kept some data, and, or we had some rules around it? And this is the whole point about data protection: that you know, a lot of African countries don't. We don't have data protection laws. The EU does. It has the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, about its citizens on data about its citizens who are not even in the EU. So even if you're outside the EU, um, you you have to conform as a tech company. Um, to how, how to handle their data. And it's about, it's about um, everything, about how, how, are you, how are you mining this data, how are you handling it, where are you storing it, how are you processing it, transparency of it, when, uh, when, when do you get rid of it, everything. And we're not on the table in that respect. There are concurrent debates happening here in the, in the tax field. How are, we, how are we gonna tax the digital economy? And yet, uh, uh, concurrent, I mean, another debate in another sector on, on data protection, specifically for cybersecurity and privacy policy concerns, and they're not speaking. So when we're talking about data being the digital gold or the digital oil, that's, that's exactly what it is, and we're not, we're not on that table. When we talk about regulating cryptocurrencies, we're, we're not even regulating our own data, so let's begin there. Um, 
Um, so, so again, thinking about China. So then I thought, okay, would this would this work in in Africa if we had a firewall like China does? Um, I, I'm not sure. Do we have the uh, maybe smaller countries? Definitely not, because it only works in economies of scale. Um, but maybe if we did it um, at the regional economic level, maybe we'd have we'd see something there. Um, and again, it doesn't have to be absolute. Doesn't have to be absolute data localization. We can just have barriers in specific sectors, um, or or do what the EU does, where it's it's not localization, but they have strict rules on how the um, data is transferred that it acts as de facto localization. Um, so um, the point being that. Um, to, to, um, in, in terms of data, you know, we, we've talked a lot about being on the, if we're not at the table or on the menu, in the tech field, if we're not producing, it's because we're the product. <laughs> if we're not the consumer, we're the product. So how does that actually happen? So I, I, I've talked about inequality at the global level because we're not at the table in the data protection regulations. So we can't, we can't regulate what we don't, um, our own digital gold or digital oil if we're not, um, we can't benefit from taxation if we don't regulate it. Um, but how is value created? Or maybe, and maybe it could even answer the question of value creation because if something is stored somewhere, if it's, if it's processed somewhere, then that, that answers the question of where, where is the value actually created. Um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, mobile lending because um, the inequality, uh, that addresses the inequality perspective for me. That's where most of the poor are actually um, intersecting with fintech. Um, if you look at the mobile lending apps, you'll see 10 million users, 1 million users. So in Kenya alone, that's at least more than a quarter of our population accessing money through mobile loans. So when we think of regulating, or when we think of fintech and innovation, are we promoting inequality by exacerbating this loan, this, um, this cycle, this cycle of, um, uh, of poverty, um, because if we want to tax it, they're only going to uh, pass on this um, taxation to their consumers. It's the same thing that happened with social media. We said, okay, we need to generate revenue. Let's let's increase excise duty on um, on voice data and SMS from 10 to 15 percent, and it was passed on the con to the consumer. In Uganda, they did some study on how how this in in impacted on their economy and found that. They, ha they lost internet subscriptions by 2.5 million users. That's more than the population of Kampala, because it became unaffordable. Um, and in terms of money, um, you know, in, in terms of taxpayers, they lost 1.2 million users from OTT services because of, um, they didn't want to transact by mobile. And, and the cost of mobile money transactions fell by $1.2 million, um, because again, people said this is not affordable. And then, you know, so people from the West will say, okay, but let's use VPN to access the internet. VPN is more expensive than the social media tax. Um, so I'm, as, we, as we develop regulations on FinTech, um, are we looking at the inequality perspective? Um, and even as we propose solutions, are, are we looking at that as well and how that's going to affect um, the, the common person? Um, I wanted to show a picture. Um, very quickly. Is, can you see that? Okay, it is a screenshot of a message sent to someone's contacts for default of payment um, for a mobile loan. So, um, and there's nothing illegal about it. You might think this is a breach of privacy, but it's nothing illegal because when you sign the terms and conditions for, for, a, mo for a mobile um, loan, you, you're, you're signing away your privacy. So somebody, I think the default loan was 2,550 shillings. That's less than $25. He defaulted on that. And as a result, the mobile, um, the money lending app has sent to all his contacts, please uh, uh, tell your contact, this person, that he, he has, uh, he's in arrears of 2,550 shillings and to please pay. So, I don't know, has that changed our thoughts about who do we trust our data with, tech companies or governments? Um, because, I mean, but then, I mean, that doesn't mean that they can't work together. We've seen that happen with Cambridge Analytica. Facebook um, were negligent and released the information which 
um, has been shown to have, have influenced the Kenyan elections. Um, and, and, and so um, maybe I think like our friend was saying, he, he doesn't trust any, anyone, tech or, <laughs> or government, especially when they work together. Did we, know, did we know that our election system in Kenya is, and the data is, is hosted by French company Utimorfo, and it's actually located in France? Did we know that? We're not regulating our own data. So there's a, there's, a, there's a pro and con, okay, if we keep the data, maybe we will spur innovation. We will, we will we'll create a whole ecosystem about hosting, I mean, servers, data servers and pr processing, and that's great. But the, ch but the risk of that is, is our government mis misusing our data. Or even tech companies misusing our data. We've seen even small, small, small things like, okay, going to an Impesa store and giving your number, and the next thing you know, that agent is calling you. He said, I saw you. <laughs> And you look nice. And you're like, where, where would you get my number from? Impesa. You came to my Impesa store. So um, there are risks um, in terms of um, our privacy. Um, but there's no way that we can protect it if we don't regulate it. So my, first, my, my, my real recommendation here today is we need to be on the table in terms of developing data protection laws, um, not, not only um, for commerce reasons and taxation reasons, but also for inequality, privacy, and protection. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow. <laughs> I think just to add, I tried to do a bit of research just out of the data protection issue. I went to an M-Pesa outlet, and the lady there, she knows me pretty well because I transact with her, and I asked her if I could take a snapshot of her register because I was conducting research on how much money she makes in a day in terms of you know, transferring that data. And she allowed me to take a snapshot of people's names, their ID numbers, their telephone, and the amount that they transacted. I didn't take it, I was just testing her. But you can see, right, that the, 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 the trust that you have with the financial institution can actually be lethal when it comes to now your privacy rights. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are running a little bit out of time but I know we want to ask questions. So if you will uh, indulge me with 10 minutes of your time before we break, is that okay? So just a few yeses here, it's all right. So um, we can take maybe three to five questions and I can begin with the lady at the back, the gentleman there, and another lady first, a lady here and then we'll come on that side. So the lady at the back, yeah. Thank you very much. The lady at the back has a name. My name is Kanye Sile. <laughs> Thank and you. And my question is to Naro. Naro, I think I fully agree with you. I'm not sure if we should even be having discussion of taxing cryptocurrency in 2019. Are we perhaps not discussing things that should happen in 2080? Because people go into cryptocurrency like myself precisely because we want to get out of the matrix of the banking system that is ripping us off and making mega billion profits out of us and we are gaining nothing. And because that same industry is always rescued by government, by law, when they take bad decisions and they fall into disarray, we decided, some of us, let's get out of this nonsense. So why are we even talking about taxing them if we haven't fully taxed transnational companies in Africa at least? Is that a discussion we should be having? Because we haven't taxed the matrix yet. And why are we wanting to tax the people who are out of the matrix for a reason? Yes, you can answer. Uh, so thank you for your question. And I really like that question. So I think uh, I'm uh, occupying a very interesting position as a private sector lawyer. I don't represent any of the regulators. So I represent people like you who have these opinions, who share these views. And um, most of my work involves mediating tensions between the private sector and the government. And so yes, I understand what you were saying. I understand uh, moving away from that matrix so as to avoid you know, just being held back by government and bureaucracy and all of that. But law exists for a reason. There's a reason we have structured systems in place. And yes, con your considerations must be put on the table in any conversation about regulation, in any conversation about taxation, but that table has to exist first. 
there has to be that space where private sector, government, and you know, people like me and you sit down and say, this is our fears, and this is how we can um, navigate this space. This is how we can fix that. So for example, you're saying, um, we haven't taxed transnational companies yet, and we want to tax cryptocurrency companies. Um, you know, I, I think maybe some of us all wish that nobody had to pay tax, but tax exists for a reason. It's it's an avenue for government to get revenue, and um, tax is it's helpful to government in many ways, to private sector in many ways. I think that where we should now focus that conversation is on deciding how they will be taxed and what kind of tax they will be by bearing in mind the uh, peculiarities of this industry, the peculiarities of cryptocurrency businesses, people who trade in cryptocurrency, by looking at their perspective, the platforms that they're standing on, where are they coming from? If you put those things on one hand and you have on the other hand the need for government to tax these businesses, the job of stakeholder consultation, policy consultation, dialogue. The importance of dialogue is to make sure that we are striking a balance between all of these um, competing needs. So I don't know if does that. I, I, do you know you don't want to pay taxes? That what's happening. <laughs> Thank you. Next question Thank was you. by. Uh, it was you. Thank you. Um, my name is Emmanuel. Some, yeah, I work with uh, a code in Uganda. Um, uh, just a few, two question, two comments. One is a question. Um, OTT in Uganda. I, I'm uh, someone that has experienced this, and I've done some research on it as well. Um, and one of the conclusions I came to make is that it's our government's uh, crude intervention in a space where um, we, are, we have all these transactions happening in our economy, but as you've all rightly noted, there's no way for us to even start to understand the volume of the transactions in the first place, understand uh, how much is going in and how much is coming out. So in the absence of that, um, our, revenue, our tax policy geniuses decided to to put an OTT tax. And our president, in, uh, in defending it, he's, uh, not, he's noted to have said, people are willing to give all this money to Facebook, uh, which is not a, a Ugandan farm, but there's nothing, but people are, not, are unwilling to contribute tax that can be used to, um, to, to finance development in their own countries. And uh, you might not like it, but he has a point. So I think um, OTT is just one of those things that reflects how our governments are reacting to a space they have not yet quite understood. So I'm curious to understand from the Brazil experience how information has been obtained, because discretionary reporting of my incomes is not going to work. I think we just heard from Dr. Shabalala that every one of us has this inclination to pay as little tax as we can, or if possible, not to pay any tax at all. So how does Brazil obtain this information for them to be able to compute the tax that I owe uh, uh, to, to the re revenue authority in terms of whether it is capital gains or income tax whatever it is. That, and then the, the next thing is uh, just a comment uh, on uh, the distortionary effects of uh, cryptocurrency to an economy. A developing one, for instance, like uh, where many of us come from. Um, if Libra, for instance, had, uh, as you've seen from Bitcoin, cryptocurrency has a lot of volatility. Today, the value is so high. Tomorrow, the value is so low. In instances of such volatility, when um, cryptocurrency has taken hold, as it's likely to take hold, whose uh, obligations does Facebook, for instance, take into account when Libra has some volatile issues? 
Is it, is, it, is it Facebook's obligation to its shareholders and investors or to an economy? So you can understand why the African governments uh, and many governments around the world have reacted by first of all saying, no, let's put a hold to this. Because once it takes hold, Facebook has 2.5 billion, an estimated 2.5 billion users. Imagine all those people using Libra. If there's an issue around the world, it's going to affect a huge population in this, in this world. So I'm keen to understand from uh, the, the legal mind on the panel how we can reconcile uh, these likely distortionary effects to our economies with the laws that we are making to protect ourselves. Thank you. Do you want to respond? Thank you for your question. Um, I must say to you that very recently uh, we have a um, notice issued by Brazilian Federal Revenue Service stating that exchanges must report the transactions carried out uh, before them. And then uh, they should uh, present the individual's data, the kind of transactions, the, the value uh, involved and all the, the framework of the transactions uh, that they are dealing with. But I agree with you, uh, it's totally um, taxpayer dependent. The, the compliance is totally dependent on the taxpayer. And I think this is the big challenge. I don't have an answer for that. And I think that our tax authorities, uh, the don't have also, because um, it's difficult to audit the blockchain. Of course, it's possible because uh, it's transparent, but uh, we have to have the technology, and we don't have it. So the, the path that Brazilian authorities are constructing is um, just tell the individuals and the exchanges that information must be reported. But uh, I don't think this is a, a good way to audit. And I really believe that we will, um, we will have uh, tax, uh, taxes not being paid. Uh, because we, we, we depend on uh, the taxpayer and their um, uh, willingness to comply with the tax uh, legislation. And since we don't have regulation, uh, it's very difficult to, to, to build more rules on that, more provisions on that. I don't know if I answered the question. Thank you. Was there a question on this side or there? Um, yes, the gentleman there. Yourself, the pink shirt. Uh, thank you. My name is James Mohindo. I work with the Civil Society Coalition on Oil and Gas. Uh, my question, uh, a comment and a question uh, to Professor Tatiana and uh, Miss Naro. Uh, I think uh, we all understand, especially starting with uh, 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 a comment that was made by uh, Miss Naro that uh, tax authorities and central banks are more or less autonomous, are different institutions, so tax authorities can do things in this regard of what the central bank is doing, uh, the rationale for there being a central bank is to regulate uh, money in the economy. Uh, cryptocurrencies not being regulated means there is certain money that's coming into the economy that the central bank either knows nothing about or if it does know something about, does not regulate. And that's where the distortion that Kate was talking about comes in, where you have this money that uh, is money you're not in control of as an economy or as a company. It means you're at the masses of whoever is in charge of letting that money in. The fact that, say, Bitcoin is mined means a Kenyan can sit here and start making money. And that alone is scary, especially given that these uh, the countries where the, where the mines 
of Bitcoin are found and not the country where the, the money is being enjoyed. So I think it's important for us to know that whereas we need to regulate, to look at this as individuals who, are, who want our space regulated, we also need to look at the bigger picture of a country as a whole or even uh, the continent. What are we exposing ourselves to? How much control, backdoor access do we have to this? What if we wake up one morning and everyone's, uh, it turns out to be a Ponzi scheme and they shut it down and everyone has their money in there. So all these are things beyond us as individuals wanting space where we can uh, exercise our autonomy and have money and have our privacy. We need to know that we are a society. We are one people. And that's where my question to Dr. To Professor uh, arises from how is Brazil doing it in so far as saying we don't recognize the money but we are letting people transact with that money. It means the central bank is not in charge and that is a very dangerous thing, especially for an economy that is not in charge of who is making that money they are not regulating. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I agree with you. And from my perspective, of course, um, it's a good thing that uh, central banks and uh, federal and tax authorities are independent. But um, I do think that for legal certainty purposes, um, it's not good. Uh, because if, uh, from the Brazilian perspective, uh, a cryptocurrency is a financial asset, and that's uh, because, uh, and that's why we we have just income tax on capital gain, and not just income tax. And uh, considering that, if it's a financial asset for tax purpose, from my point of view, it has to be for every purpose, because uh, we need legal certainty and we, leg we need that our system um, shows that we have uh, coherence between the institutions. And it's the same. It's an asset. OK, so it's a financial asset for tax purposes. It has to be a financial asset, asset for regulatory purposes. And I, I cannot see Brazil regulating it in a short period of time. I don't think we have political will in this sense. And I uh, really believe that uh, the regulatory authorities are waiting to see what other countries will do on that. But in this meantime, taxes um, are uh, being collected. And in many cases, the taxpayer don't, uh, the taxpayer doesn't know what to pay and if uh, he or she uh, has to pay. So I, I totally agree with your um, point. So I'd just like to add that, yes, I agree with you. Um, first, looking at it as, so tax authorities don't want to see it as currency. They want to see it as an asset. But like she said, there has to be legal certainty, which is why I keep hammering on dialogue, dialogue. Dialogue is important. There must be interagency dialogues so that we have the tax authorities and the central bank on the same page. Like this thing is an asset, so we'll tax it as an asset. Or this thing is a currency, and we will deal with it as a currency. So thank you. Thank you for your question. Okay. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so sorry. I have to close the session now. But these ladies are available throughout the day, and you can approach them individually to ask them questions. I'm very sorry we're out of time. Thank you for your attention, and thank you for listening. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we should give Laila Latif a big round of applause. If, if I was given a choice, Laila, I think I would give your panel another one hour. I think the discussion is very pertinent, and I'm sure people are going to engage with you, probably during the lunch break. Right now, I'd like to say that we're going in for uh, breakout sessions. We're going to divide this room into three, but we'd like to ask all of you, probably have to take a slight break, go out, grab yourself a cup of tea, and um, let's be back here in 10 minutes so that we can split into the different groups so that we can get back on time. All right, thank you very much. We'll see you in a bit.